In this No Old Bad interview with Ronald Zimora, a university dropout, he told us how he started his first business with just 960 naira. That's less than two US dollars. The mistake that cost him about 10 million naira and how he incidentally launched his second company, Barwell Properties. His two businesses, a digital marketing agency and a real estate company, now raking tons of millions of naira in revenue. According to Ronald, struggling entrepreneurs should know when it's time to quit a business or change their business model. He recounted how he failed many times but kept trying until he landed a gold mine. Enjoy the interview and watch till the end for a full dose of business lessons and insights. Thanks for joining us once again. Yeah. Uh, it, it, your, your story is an interesting one. And so I'm going to start. A lot of people, the Ronald people see now is the successful entrepreneur Ronald. I mean, but that was not how you started, obviously. Absolutely. The 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 odds were against you when you started out. Yeah. A university dropout. You had nine hundred and sixty naira mm -hmm. in your pocket. Yeah. How did you build it from there? Okay. Um, it was hard. <laughs> that was that's like you know the very first thing. Um. I was down to I woke up one morning and I had just nine hundred and sixty naira. I had actually borrowed some money from my sister. Mm -hmm. You know, um we went to get, go to a seminar, I had paid for the seminar, mm -hmm. you know, I had run my first ad which which bombed, you know, and I was also you know, also had to feed and had to do a lot of stuff, pay yeah. some bills from that money. Yeah. And what happened was, one morning I was down to just now around 16 era, and I told myself, and I said, if all of this, if I finish this money, mm -hmm. and there's nothing else, there's no one, I doubt my sister is going to give me any more money, and there's nobody else I can go to and ask for money. So I had you know, I had to think of something. So what I did was I started thinking about what I could do with 916 and what could I do, what could I do. And then I remember that one of the, the seminars that I attended, mm -hmm. I paid for and attended, I saw a guy selling CDs there. And when when I remember that, I was like, okay, I think I can do, I can do this CD thing. You know, so I I bought a pack of CDs. I think, if I remember correctly, for around five hundred naira, hundred CDs at the time, and I went to a server cafe. I downloaded some ebooks that I knew were going to be really interesting. Private label rights ebooks because those that gives you the right to resell them. Mm. So I downloaded those ebooks and I put them in. Uh, I put them in the folder and then I called my sister again, but this time not to ask for money, but to ask for her laptop. Okay. So I I got her laptop and I was burning this because it has the laptop had a CD burner. Mm. I started burning the CDs on um, the ebooks from that folder onto the CDs. By the time I got to CD number 38, I remember correctly. The city burner stopped working because it had been overworked. You know, it takes quite a while for it to burn the yeah. CD. So, but I had eight CDs and I took, I opened up WordPad and I, what I did was I listed out the names of the of the ebooks, some of the ones that I knew were catchy, mm -hmm. right? And then I, I created like a table of four boxes. Instead of instead of um, Microsoft Word, and I and I said these are the best marketing and sales books you will ever find, all in one place. And I put some of the titles, the very catchy ones. So I put, I just copied and pasted into the four boxes, and then I did a computer printout yes. of the page, mm -hmm. you know, and then I photocopied it. Then I cut it up and then put them on in the sleeves system. that came with the ceilings, mm -hmm. and then. I went to the next seminar venue and I started selling them for 1,000 naira each. And the 
first day I sold 22. Wow. Yeah. And I was like, wow. You know, the second day I had sold probably, I sold probably nine. Because I quickly figured out that a lot of the people who bought the 22 had copied for a lot of other people. Other people, okay. Right? So, but I sold only, I think I sold like maybe another nine, if I'm correct. So I sold around maybe 31 or so. But it gave me an idea. And what I did for the next several months was to burn more and more cities. So what I did next was I just found um, um, a place where I could burn the cities in, in Ikeja, Kokoto mm -hmm. Village. So I'll go there, I'll just pay them, and then they'll burn all 100 cities. And I was going to different seminar venues. Anyway, I would just buy newspapers and look for seminar venues or buy magazines. And is there anywhere there being a seminar? And I'll be there. And I'll go right before the break period, yeah. because then people will leave the seminar venues to come out to buy some snacks to eat. And then I was hurting my city. So I did that for maybe around two months and raise, raise over 300,000. Wow. Yeah. So basically, that's kicked off everything. Everything. Yeah. You see, let me take you back a little bit. I Before, I want to know your mindset at the time you ever, even in your widest imagination, thought you could do anything with 960 naira. An average entrepreneur today will tell you he does not have money to start a business. Mm -hmm. What 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 gave you the guts to think that you could do anything with nine hundred and fifty dollars? I mean, that's about I mean two dollars in in today's conversion. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> I didn't have any choice. I mean, that was all I had. So I had to be really really creative. I had to be really really resourceful. I had to sit down and say, what can I do with nine hundred and sixteen naira? Obviously, I couldn't, you know, go rent a shop with nine hundred and sixteen naira or import something with 916 naira. That's, so I had to basically ask myself, what are the things that I know that I can do right now with 916 naira? Well, prior to that, I've been reading books, listening to motivational yeah, absolutely. speakers. And it, okay. Absolutely, I've been reading books. That must have also stimulated your... Yeah, I've been reading books. I re because, I mean, I knew about private labor rights at the time <laughs> okay, already. Yeah. So I already knew that if I sold private labor rights products, I wouldn't be... Uh, you know, liable for liable for maybe copyright uh, infringement yeah. and all of that. So I knew, and that was why I specifically went for private label rights books. You know, so um, that was all I had. I had no choice. I think the thing is, when you have your back against the wall, you're yeah. always going to come up with something, and you don't want to fold up and die. Yeah. If your back is against the wall, you don't have to fold up and die. You basically have to work with what you have. So from then on, has it been um, everything you've been doing, have they been successful or you've failed at something? Of course, I've, I've failed at a lot of things. I, I, um, in 2015, I started a network marketing team mm. because one of my goals is actually to own a supplement company and market the products using the network marketing model. Mm -hmm. That's something I plan to do in the future. So... I started a network marketing team in 2015 because I needed to understand the industry, learn it. I wanted to get involved. I didn't want to do it from the outside. Mm -hmm. So um, my goal was to um, bring in a company to Nigeria. I didn't want to just sign up as a distributor because I spent all of 2014 buying courses, books, watching videos, attending events, paid free online, especially in that industry because prior to that, I hated it. The industry, I didn't like the business model, right? And I knew that I needed to get to the point in my head where it was okay for me, it was acceptable to me, you know. And I had to do a lot of um, mind reset, so to say, about the industry. I had to begin to understand the industry for exactly what it was. It was a legit industry, there were just a few people in the industry that give it a bad name, right? So so I spent an entire year, and then in the course of my doing the research, I figured out very quickly that if you are bringing a company into, into a country first, you get to be number one, mm -hmm. right? And in many cases, you even get to be on the board of the company locally, right? So you're not just a distributor, you're also an owner, okay. you know, even if, if not for the entire global company, but for the local one. You know, so, 
I was like, you know, what's the point? Let me just bring in a company. So I started talking to a company in the USA and I got word of mouth assurances from them that they were going to launch if we, if we had at least 200 people. And in three weeks, we had 204 people signed up and they ultimately decided they were not going to come. And I spent money hiring, renting an office for around three million. I spent the money building a team site for my team you know, another three million with an Indian firm. Um, and they suddenly said, you know what, we're not going to come. We don't want to expand to Nigeria anymore. And How did because, you take that? Uh, I took it badly. I was, I was angry, mm. but not so much at them, but more at myself because I shouldn't have taken word of mouth assurances as fact or as a basis for spending a lot, a lot of money doing this. I should have waited for them to come and then I will start doing all of this. But I was trying to do it to preempt them and to show them that we were ready for them to come. Um, so I had to call a meeting of all 204 people and tell them, look, this company is not coming here again. So we're disbanding and I'm going to refund everybody. So I refunded everybody out of my pocket again. Wow. So I probably lost anywhere between eight to 10 million. Naira. Naira. So I was kind of pissed off and I stayed away from the industry. Uh, I got a lot of people asking me to join and I said, no, I'm not going to join. You know, um, I had to go back again and even study it further. And I spoke to a lot of top NRs who had been in the industry and who had retired, who had made a lot of money. And I began to learn why the company refused to let me, refused to come, right? First of all, I didn't have a, a background in, in the industry, mm. so they were never even going to work with me. So those word of my assurances were, were, were not, they were in something to, I should have banked on, right? So I, because I didn't have a background in the industry, you know, they were not going to work with me. Uh, second is the Nigerian business climate, a lot of companies don't want to deal with it, right? So I learned a lot of that. So I was like, okay. So right. we'll, we'll come back to next for marketing. Mm -hmm. Now you have built two successful businesses. Yeah. At what point did you think that it was time to launch another business mm -hmm. and why real estate? Uh, what we did was um, we have built it and exhaust for, for a lot of, you know, for years. You know, and it started taking its toll. Right, I I said I began to become less and less in love with the with the business, wow. with the model because it required a lot of back and forth, the client interfacing, mm. you know, doing presentations, all of that. You know, I started training some people in house to do those, but a lot of the clients also required you to be involved, you know, in the entire process. And I said falling out of love with it, you know, in increasing doses, you know, if you would call it that. All right. So, so we, we had a lot of cash, right? And, and we were just sitting there and we were like, okay, we need to do something else. And we had worked with a lot of real estate clients in, in, with, in this sun exhaust. And we saw that it was a sector that had a lot of growth. So we were like, you know, we understand the real estate market. We've sold a lot of stuff. Okay. Hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars worth of products in, in that sector. And it for doesn't other seem companies. like yeah, for other companies. And it doesn't seem like it's a terribly hard thing to get into. Right. So so we said discussing it, but we're not kind of definite. Mm -hmm. We're looking at that, we're looking at starting a supplement company also, you know, even Though um, we didn't use an automatic model to sell it, but we knew we could, we could do that. But we're looking at selling a supplement company. We're looking at um, um, streamlining our uh, our publishing business and actually turning turning it to a real business because we basically just run it like a hobby thing. Okay. Right. You know, we just do the teaching thing because we enjoy it, not really because you know because of the cash. So we're looking at those options. And then in 2018, we went to the World Cup in, in Russia. And we we were at Volgograd, lovely, lovely city, mm. you know, and we flew from Volgograd to St. Petersburg where we played Argentina. Mm. 
And where we had booked to stay in St. Petersburg, when we got there, he took my bread away. He's like, my goodness, this is massive. It had all these massive, massive buildings that had like 300 flats, you know, all occupied, you know, beautiful place. We entered our room, the design, you know, you know what we call it self-contained here, but the way it was designed, the way it was arranged, you know, you could hide the, the kitchen side, you could, lovely place. And we were like, man, we should build something like this in Nigeria. Okay. We should build something like this in Nigeria. So uh, when we got back, we were like, you know what, we're going to do the real estate thing. But then we... You know, selling something is different from actually getting involved. Yeah. So we needed to actually understand the intricacies. So I called one of our our, our clients, you know, um, Mr. Deba Dejano. He owns Reality Point. Okay. Um, he's the CEO. So we called him up and said, look, we want to get into the real estate business. And I've known you for nearly 15 years. I want you to tell us what to do. And he was gracious. He said, by all means, I'm going to tell you what to do. He didn't mind that you become a competitor. No, he didn't mm -hmm. mind. He didn't mind. I think growth minded people really don't care so much. Mm -hmm. Right? You know, and in any case, they had they had an advantage of ours. They had they have been selling real estate for over 20 years. So mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't like we we're going to come and upstage them. Right. So we met with him and basically told us everything we needed to know. You know, told us this how you start. Make sure you start with land. You know, don't get into development until you understand. You know, and you've made a lot of contacts. You know, in the ministries and all of that. So, um, this is how to make sure you buy the lands properly. This is where to check. You know, basically the entire thing. So, that was how we started buy well. So after meeting with him, we went to Dubai. We sat down. We planned out. The marketing and the second reason why we went to Dubai was Dubai real estate is one of the fastest growing real estate, um, um, uh, one of the fastest growing real estate sectors in the world. So we went there, we wanted to see how they sold their real estate. So we talked to a lot of real estate companies, we saw how they sold us, how they approached us, how they, you know, all of that. And we gathered all of that information okay. too, and then we added it to what we were already planning. And when we came back, we started by well in 2018. But then again, if you're talking about uh, Dubai, mm -hmm. I mean, their own operations, everything is different. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Nigeria is a, oh, it's a different ball game. Mm -hmm. You know, there is the Omonile yeah. issue. And the, how, do you, how did you navigate all those? Yeah, so, all those? so what you do, and what, like I tell people all the time, what to do is to understand the environment that you do business in and work alongside it, not against it. So what we took from Dubai mostly was the marketing approach, right? So for example, in Dubai, if you buy real estate, you're not really paying to a real estate company, you're paying to a government agency, the government agency that is in charge of real estate because they want to make sure they protect the integrity of the investment. Mm. So, so you make the payments and they don't give the money to the real estate company. So they give, they, what they do is that the real estate company starts the project. And then, so every project has a timeline. Okay. You buy. So mm. if it's 12 months, then it's 12 months. Unless something untoward happens. So what the government will do is, if it's a 12 month project, so they will divide the entire thing by by three. Okay. So the company will do the first phase of the project for four months, and then the government will pay them 40% of the monies that you pay. Okay. And then they will do another four months, and then the government will give them 40% of the money again. Mm -hmm. When they complete it, the government gives them the balance. Okay. That's how they run, the, they the run their stuff there. Right. Okay. So that way, the investors are protected, right? But it also comes with a caveat especially if you are paying on installments, the moment you miss one payment, you've lost everything you've paid before then. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, so, so in Dubai, you are paying directly to the government agency in charge. In Nigeria, you are paying to, to the developers, right, or whoever is selling, selling the land. Now, with the Monilis, basically what we did was to just talk to the, the, um, 
families who own the land i said we're not we don't we're not going to deal with these guys you guys are going to deal with them we don't want to deal with them we don't want to have anything to do with that so the families so the families do that in any case they are part of the families anyway so so you just have these agreements ahead of time yeah. but then again there is a ton of i mean i can see there is a proliferation of real estate companies in, in nigeria yeah. Sometimes you don't even know which one to uh, mm -hmm. to patronize um, fraud here and there. Yeah. You know uh, how how what is what is different about buy well properties, for example. What are you guys doing differently? So basically, what we do is we don't even sell land until we tell you to go and inspect and do not just the inspection. Go check out, make sure the documentation is yeah. correct. Yeah. We can do it for you. Right, because I mean we've already done that, mm. so you can take our word for it. But we're asking you not to take our word for it. Go to this ministry and go to this office and authenticate it by yourself. It's going to cost you some money, but better you lose a small amount of money than you lose this big one that mm. we're asking you to pay for the for the, for the land. So because we are upfront like that, a lot of people just take our word for it. Now, there's been a couple of them who have also said, you know what, I'm going to go check myself. And they go check themselves. So mm -hmm. yeah, it adds an additional expense to to the cost, right? But they are they are they are at peace. Right? So um so what we, we have done to be different was is to be very, very upfront with our dealings. You know, be very, very upfront with, um, especially with the ways the documentation are done. So, for example, if a couple is buying land, we don't register the, the we don't title the documents in the name of one partner. We, we title it in the name of both. Okay. So, if it's a husband and wife that are buying both their names, you know, because again, these things are, are subject to law. So, we make sure that. When it comes to interpretation, it is not ambiguous, mm -hmm. right? It's very, very clear that you know both of mm -hmm. you own on this property, you know. So uh, we make this sense upfront, so people, our clients, love us for, for that. that. Yeah. So over the years, what 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 are the lessons you have learned when you want to st starting a business, running a business in Nigeria, for example? What are yeah. the lessons we have learned? It's it's tough. It's tough because government policy never never sits for two months before it changes. changes. Right. But Nigeria is a growth place. You know, as as bad as it is, there is room for growth. It's, it's, it's been worse in the last six, seven years, right? Um, but the the potential is there. But of course what we need to do as a country is to go beyond just potential to actual actual um manifestation of of what we have but what we have done is to be on top of the marketing side there is really not a marketing can cure there's no business problem marketing can cure really if you know how to sell you know how to create the best offers you know how to make people listen to you rather than your competition you're always going to come out on top provided that you're selling a valuable product, something people want. So we, we make sure we stay on top of the marketing side and that we get better and better and better at it because we know that if we can convey enough value to the marketplace, that we're going to we're going to make sales. So we do that. And then on the flip side, we cut costs like crazy. We try to cut our costs as to as bare minimum as we can so what that means is that we don't do there's no show off there's no show button there's mm. no you know untoward flossing like you know like people will say like a lot of real estate uh, yeah, yeah. Like, mm. so that's why it's kind of like you know, we're not out there out there mm. you know there are certain kinds of advertisement we won't be caught there doing i don't want to, i don't want to mention <laughs> the specifics right but there are certain that we will never do Mm. Right, because they are mostly just ego trips. Right, it is they are not like like they're giving you a return on that investment. So they're more like, hey, look, we're here, and, mm. you know. So we just prefer to do the 
kinds of marketing that will give us the ROI back. Yeah. But then you 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 are not. Is are you saying it is is wrong to make a lot of noise with your business? No, no. Every company you have to understand that every industry matures, mm. right? Every industry matures. So, so let me use the the sports betting industry for as an example. So when it got started, when Arabic got started in because they our client, okay. and they were the first in the country to start. When they started, right. Well, it was just basically direct marketing, right? Hey, this is what you can do to win money, and you know, you come in, and then you know, we market to them repeatedly, right? And it was it worked for a lot of years, right? But then it got to the point where the industry had matured, had matured to the point where practically everybody is selling the same thing. So there's very little to differentiate you from the other. What you now need to sell is your brand. At that point, what you now need to sell is reliability. You know, we're going to pay you mm. immediately. You mm. understand? Those are the things that you now need to sell. So you can't be saying at that point, hey, come and be with us. We have the best odds. Nobody cares because everybody has... The odds are kind of the same anyway. So even if there are differences, maybe it's a point zero. One or so it's it's very very insignificant. So you can't use that as an advantage anymore. So what you do now is just to make sure that your name is in people's faces and is in their head. So at that point, yes, it's important, right? But the industry has to mature enough to the to the point where you need to use the to make noise, so to say. So basically, buy well does only lands for now. You're not developing. Yeah, any? yeah, we're going to developments this year. Okay. We're going to do developments this year um, because we want to move away. We want to the developments are the big deal yes. in real estate yeah. actually, right? But we're trying to get our feet wet mm. with with selling you know lands and all of that. But we're going to developments this year. What would you say are the things people should be looking out for before buying a property in Nigeria? Yeah. First of all, they need to be sure that it is not because again, um, based on the land use act and you know and how property is administered in Nigeria, all land belongs to government. The state government, not even federal, right? So what it means is that if you're buying land, you are basically the government is not is basically giving it to you in trust. You're holding it in trust for the government, so to say. Right? The government can wake up tomorrow and say, that land that we give you, we want to use it for something, and they just give you a compensation for it and take it over. Right? Even if it is bona fide yours, because ultimately, the land belongs to the government. Right. right? So what you need to do, the very first thing before you buy land is to be sure that that government is not part of government is not under government acquisition. So what that means is that it is not in an area that government has designated for something. Okay. Right. Mm. Because especially in Lagos and in a lot of in a lot of states, right, a lot of the master plans are already done. They've been done for decades. There are areas that are already designated as farm areas, right? There are areas that are already des designated as um, you know, public parks, and you know, we're going to have a public park here, and all these things with, with you know, markings and, 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 you know, and surveys. Everything has been done. So you can verify because, that with uh, so the you can, ministry. You can, exactly. You can verify that with the Ministry of Lands. You can verify that with the Survey General's Office in every state. Mm. So the very first thing to do is to be sure that that land is not under government acquisition. Right now, verifying these things take a lot of time and a lot of money, right? So maybe not a lot of money, so because a lot of money is subjective, depending on who you are talking to, yes. right? But let's say anywhere between the, like, one hundred fifty thousand to two hundred fifty thousand, right? So a lot of people are unwilling to do that upfront ver ver verification, and I quite understand why. If you are looking at three different properties, you can't go start paying to do verification. Mm. That means you are probably going to pay seven fifty, give or take, 
to verify before you now make a decision yeah, and buy the land for maybe one million. Yes. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I understand the reluctance. So that reluctance now makes a lot of people simply just trust what the real estate companies say. Okay. Which is also in and of itself wrong. Because you can't just take them for the award. Especially, let me say this, especially the new guys, right? Even some of the old guys, to be honest, right? You can't just take them for the award. It's important that you do verifications. It's important that you Google that the name of that area. You want to see whether there are issues that have emanated from buying property in that area. Red, uh, because once there is, that should raise a red flag and you should start asking a lot of questions because you are putting a lot of money down for these things. That's number one. Number two is you need to understand the documentation that the land you want to buy has because there are st several stages of documentation, right? So there is the survey, which anybody can do. Now, the survey has to be registered. So that's why you see some people say registered survey. Okay. So the survey gets registered. When the survey gets registered, the real estate company cannot apply for an excision. So what they are basically saying is government, all right, we now want you to grant us permission to sell this. The government will now look at the archive and know whether that, that area is designated for some habitation, kind. maybe is it is there for people to live in? If it is, they can now grant that decision. Okay. If it's not, they will tell you no. We can't. Right? So let's assume that they do. And these things take a lot of time because, I mean, our process in Nigeria is very, very slow. So it can take anywhere between 6 to 18 months. Oh. Right? So if it is true, then the government will now grant the decision and gazette it. It's only after it has been, you know, some comp some states don't gazette, you just run the decision and the governor can give his approval by signing the certificate of occupancy. Okay. So you can either go, so once it's excised, yes. that is the only time a CFO can be granted for it. Now, if the land already has a CFO, then that's the best because now it is sure that really there's really nothing that can happen. Right? Yeah. So if it's, if he has if the excise has been granted and see it hasn't been, it is also equivalent to because it has been excised anyway. Mm. Right? It is just the the process, the delay in the process that is that is that is making the CFO not to be available yet. Okay. Because routinely the governors refuse to sign CFOs. Because real estate is a political bargaining chip. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So a lot of them refuse, even when the law has been excised, a lot of them don't sign the self rules. Okay. So they just keep it there and then play politics with it until a new administration comes in, you know, and it can continue from there or the new person can just sign. For example, um, the former governor of Lagos just signed self rules his first year. Every other thing that was excised after his first year never got a self rule till now. So Right, so um, the new, the current governor is very likely going to sign a new set of self self course too, right? So this is how this thing, okay. this thing is go, right? So it takes time, anywhere between six to eighteen months to get to the point where it gets the the self course. Now, if the land has just a survey, you have to be very very wary because it's not even gotten to excision yet. Because it might never get excised. And if it doesn't get excised, you're you basically just throwing your money away. If it doesn't get excised. Because it can. Right? And the very reason why you need to do the very first set of it in of um be sure that it's not under government acquisition. You at that point also you will know what that area has been designated for. For example, in Epe. Lots of the land in Ebe were are designated for farmlands, but people are selling it for, for residential buildings. Oh. And the people who buy those lands, they will never take possession of it. Never. Not going to happen. Oh. Never going to happen. Because they are designated as farm area. Unless the government wakes up and changes that designation to residential. As of now. 
but as of now, and I doubt they will, because these things are made provision of. The idea is also when there are farm areas, you know, people can set up farms in those areas so that they can feed the city. That is the essence of having farm areas. Yes. Otherwise, if you build houses everywhere and people can't find food, what's the point? That's a problem. Exactly. Mm. You know, so when you're doing those that first check will help you know what's this area even de designated yeah, for? for? Right? Is it for is is it under an area that government has mapped out mapped out for something, maybe for farmland, maybe for public works, maybe for public utility. You need to know. I guess that's what we we'll see with um, when government wants to build um, a road, yeah, big exactly. roads and, and all, then they demolish the houses. And then people come out and scream and yes, shout, yes. you know, government is wicked. Yeah, maybe maybe they were wicked in demolishing it, but what, what, what are they to do anyway? You were not supposed to build anything here yeah. from day one. You, it was your job to be certain before you spent money, money. buying land there. So if you go buy land there, it's not the government's business. Right? So they would need to build something. So it's like the new coastal road, right? Yes. That has been constructed now. They're demolishing a lot of things along that road. If your house is in this, anywhere alongside it, well, sorry, but it's going to go away and you're not going to get compensated for it. Doesn't matter how long you go to court and argue, you're go always going to lose because you were supposed not to have an issue. Right? So, um, so the, I was talking about the excision area. It is dependent on, on, um, on the that land being excised, right? So if the land is within areas that government has mapped out for yeah. residential, government would not say okay, we excise it, because when you apply for excision, you have to tell them the, the reason why you want it excised. Mm -hmm. Is it for residential? Is it for farmland? Mm -hmm. Okay. You understand? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And if you say it's for farmland, but you go and build residential, then they will see demolition. Mm -hmm. oh. Because you give them a wrong reason. Uh -huh. So so if it's just a survey, it's, it is very likely that it will still not get excised. So the safe lands, by lands are already excised, mm -hmm. at exactly. least, at the very least, yes. already have an excision and the self is pending. Because now we know it's just politics that's that stopping, stopping it. it. Exactly. And it couldn't be um, reversed? The excision couldn't be reversed? Again, it depends. Again, it depends. Maybe governments can will say, you know, we have new plans, so we need to build something, and this area is you part of it. So then you might be compensated. To, yeah, you are going to be compensated because they've granted the excision. Anyway. Right. Okay. Yeah. So moving on, um, a few days ago, you put out a tweet. Was it a few days ago? Maybe more yesterday. Mm -hmm. That um, to make big money, yeah, you yeah. need to multiply people multiply and multiply money. Multiply money. Yeah. Can you expand it a little bit on that? Okay, so um, basically, when it comes to making money, right, you have to understand that leverage is important. So multiplying people and multiplying money is basically leverage. When you take money and you put it in the stock, is, in the stock exchange, or you buy crypto, mm. right? The hell of people are doing now, yes. right? You're basically multiplying money. Because now, the money, the value is going up without you being directly involved. What you want to do to create long-term wealth is to have things that increase in value, investment increase in value without you being directly involved. Because you only have 24 hours every day. Then you can't even manufacture more time. So, so when you invest in things like crypto or gold or, or the stock exchanges, you, know, you buy company shares, is it is basically other people doing the work to increase the value of those things. Now, of course, you need to be careful what you choose to put the money into to multiply it because if you choose wrongly, the values are going to go down. But if you choose right, the values are going to go up. And you are not there personally on your own trying to do it by yourself, right? Because the truth is that you just can't, right? So that is one way to multiply money. money. Now, to multiply people is basically you using other people's time, right? So, for example, I multiply people here by hiring more and more people 
to handle our business so that I, I just coordinate, right? I just make them make sure that they do their best in bringing out output for the company. So the, the bigger the company grows, the more people I can hire. So that way I'm multiplying people, I'm multiplying their output. Because if I sit down to do everything by myself, then so it's not you. going to work. Another way to multiply people is, like for example, starting a network marketing company, a network marketing team, because now you can have distributors sell for you. Another way you can multiply people is to have affiliates. So now you're not spending your own money trying to, you know, trying to run adverts with your own money. You know, you simply tell people, look, if you sell this stuff for me, I'm going to give you 40% of the profit as commission. Now they will go set up the, the marketing process by themselves. They will run the ads by themselves. However they do it, you know that you're only paying them when they get a result, which is a sale. Hmm. And the more of them you can get, the better your company is going to do, the more sales you are going to have. You know, and one of the companies that's doing that brilliantly is Amazon. Amazon has hundreds of thousands of affiliates reselling their products for them. And they pay them anywhere between 6 to 20%, right? And they have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of such people who make them a ton of money, right? So there are like, these are the different instances where you can multiply people or multiply time. Because if you try to, and I made a mistake, at the, you know, when I got started, I was trying to do everything by yourself. By myself, you know, because I, I was like, nobody can do it as well as I can, which may be true, but it doesn't mean that other people can't do it satisfactorily, because those are two different things. Yes. Right. So it was until my mentor told me, see, I didn't get this worldly by doing everything by myself. I have twelve companies. And all I just do is just monitor what the people we employ in those companies do. What we do is we're multiplying people, we're multiplying their time and the work that they do for us, basically. So, and so this this will also inform the kind of business you choose to go into, right? Absolutely. It, yeah, because there are some businesses that just don't lend to you multiplying people. They're not scalable. They're not scalable, right? Mm. And it, it it's it's. That's why it's very, very critical, you know, uh, because I see a lot of people tr do get into business and then they see struggle. They're not struggling because business is not good. They're just struggling because their business model is faulty from the get-go, mm. right? So if you start making shoes, for example, mm. and I'm not saying making shoes is bad, but you have to sit down and ask yourself, so I want to make shoes. How do I, what is my one year plan, my five year plan, my 10 year plan for mm. this? If you really want to make a lot of money doing it, then you can't just sit down and try to do it all by yourself. You have to expand, you have to get people coming, right? And you probably have to now start getting mechanized tools for, mm. for making it. What you want to do is that you want to shorten time. Exactly. You want to shorten time because the more you shorten time and you're efficient and still making maximum output despite shutting time, then if you can do that, then you have an advantage, an excellent, excellent advantage. So it's like the story of, uh, of Ford and when he established the assembly line. Mm -hmm. You know, normally everybody would, they would put the cars and couple them one by one. And then he came up with the idea of the assembly line. I think I read a story where he saw horses moving through his table and they were being cleaned as they moved. So it was like, why don't you adopt something like this? So now you have an assembly line and the cars are moved through a line and there are people that are fitting specific things. So they finish on one car, this one mm -hmm. goes, the next one. And it basically cut the time it took to produce one car by, by hours, right? So um, again, I also see people get into a business where there are loads and loads of competitors. So while competition is good, it's a very good indicator that there is a lot of space in an industry, right? If you go in mm -hmm. 
into a sector where there's a lot of competition and you become like one of the people already there, you're not going to make a lot of money. You have to stand out. You have to be different. Because I see a lot of people try to sell hair. Right? And I'm, I'm like, jeez. This is, this is going to be a tough mountain to climb because how are you going to even differentiate your hair? Right? Yeah. So, um, we've seen examples of for example, in Miss One Neck on IG, who simply went high end. She was selling her, but she sold high end. She just went high end. So, which was a very a very quick way for her to differentiate herself. So, right? So, she didn't sit down and try to sell cheap hair like every other person. You just went high end. Because there's always a market for high end. Uh-huh. Right? There's always a market for high end. And so, it's like people who sell sports cars. You know, there's a guy just opposite us here, Mayfair Autos. You know, he the cars he sells, he sells mostly Benzes and Toyota cars, and those cars are bloody expensive. But he makes sales every day because he just chose to go high end, right? So you've got to be sure that your model is one that you can expand, right? You can expand it, and you also have to be adventurous, right? You can't sit down and say. You know, I'm just going to do business just in Lagos, right? And because contrary to what people say, and this is important, people always like saying, you know, we're a country of 200 million people. Yes, we're a country of 200 million people, but we are not a country of 200 million people who can spend money. We're barely a country of maybe 10 to 18 million who have money to spend. The rest don't have money to spend. They barely they live on less than two dollars a day. They're mm. not going to buy your ten thousand naira shoes. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Right. So what it means now is that your market, addressable market, is probably ten to eighteen million, give or take, and all of them are still not going to buy your stuff. Of course. So you now have to segment within, within that that group, you know. But the idea is, is you want to hone down and be very, very certain who or the kind of people that you can sell your product to and focus on selling to just them. Just people. So define your target. To, to define them very, very thoroughly. So mm-hmm. in the case of shoes, for example, you have to say, decide, okay, do I sell to young, um, opposite mobile people, right, who are, you know, working in maybe um, private institutions, maybe say banks, insurance companies, because they need to look smart, they need to look good. You know, they're also looking to not spend too much too money. Much. Right. So your your what it means is that your shoes have to be moderately priced. Mm. And then you have to convey convey the the you know the value of buying yours versus maybe buying some imported one mm. you know from the market. Especially if the prices are comparable. Yeah. So, what do you tell some entrepreneurs who are still struggling? I mean, still struggling to get the business going. I mean, they're even contemplating probably shutting down or, or mm-hmm. thinking of it another business. How mm-hmm. how do they navigate that? That uh... no, the the standard answer for this kind of question is you know they need to persevere and keep pushing. But I don't I don't do standard answers right because a lot of the standard answers don't generally work. The first, if you are struggling with your business, there are, you need to find out the symptom. What is the, not the symptom, because the symptom is what you see. Mm-hmm. It is that you are struggling. You need to find out the root cause. Why are you struggling? Is it a marketing problem? Mm-hmm. Is it a, a business type choice problem? You need to be sure. If you are good with marketing, but you are still struggling, then it's not the marketing. It's either that the kind of business that you are doing it's just not working. Mm. For the model. The model. So it's either you figure out a way to make change it and still be in that model or to simply switch. Sometimes people need to quit what they're doing. I know the mantra is, oh, don't quit. You know, stay there. And Keep but, going. But a lot of times it's bullshit. A lot of times people just need to quit and do something else. So you don't waste a lot of time. But before you quit, you also need to do the evaluation. Why? So that you are not just quitting something prematurely, right? You need mm. to know why you are struggling. 
why am I struggling? It is the, is it the choice of business that I that I'm doing, right? For example, I was talking to someone who makes um, confectionaries, big scales, you know, and he was telling me the business is tough. I said, business can be tough. You bake cake for for goodness sake. People buy these things all the time. You've got to figure out exactly why they are not buying yours. Oh, yes. He said, yeah, because a lot of people do it. I said, exactly. So you've got to be different. So I told him, look, niche down. Decide what kind of cake maker you are going to be. Don't be a cake for all purposes kind of person. Maybe you are going to be the birthday cake person. And you stand out. And you make different shapes and sizes and styles of birthday cakes. And everybody knows you as the birthday cake person. Guess what they are going to do? When they have someone they want to buy a cake for for their birthday, guess mm-hmm. who they are going to remember you? So I said, it's, or maybe you become the wedding cake person. But you've got to, you've got to sit carve down an inch. and carve an inch. Because it is increasingly important, especially in that sector where, where it, is, it doesn't take too much for someone to also join your business and become a competitor. But your venture is low. Uh, but very, very low. Mm. So it's like when blogging was a rave. All you needed was a domain name, a hosting, and voila, a blogger. Mm-hmm. Because WordPress is free. Right? And then everybody tried to be a blogger because, I mean, then I think you posted her jeep. And suddenly everybody wants to be a blogger, and then they do it for one year, and then everybody quits and starts to think of doing something yeah. else, right? So, um, what they did was they didn't understand what she did. She carved the niche. She started a blog, a gossip blog. Mm. She was the first, and she drove it to the end. So they could still have success with blogging, but if they had probably done a different niche. Aha, yeah. you know, so you've got to, the important thing they need to do is to figure out, is it my business sector that is not working? If the business sector, if people are there and they're doing well, then it's not the business sector problem, then it's very likely a marketing problem. So they need to know exactly which, is it the kind of business that I'm doing or is it that I don't know how to properly convey my message and sell the product? They need to figure out that it is from the basis of figuring out that that we now determine what they do next. So if it is a business sector problem, then they need to probably figure out how to stand out or quit, right? Or if it is a marketing problem, then they just need to get better at marketing. If they don't want to do it, then they probably have to hire a firm to handle their marketing for them. Yeah. <laughs>